Erasmus, uh, Christopher John Price, who got an undergraduate degree in electrical and electronic engineering and a PhD in mathematics, both from University of Canterbury. He is currently the deputy head of the School of Mathematics and Statistics at Canterbury University. He is associate editor of COAP, Computational Optimization and Applications, and his research interests, his research interests uh, span from optimization to applications in acoustic, acoustics and uh, direct search methods in optimization. And in particular, he has important contributions to the Nelder Mead algorithm, which is an algorithm used uh, by MATLAB in FMIN search. To, he has contributions to global optimization and applications of optimization in industry and uh, commerce. Uh, or contributions to semi-infinite programming and acoustics and also contributions to uh, viscoelasticity in which he uh, applies uh, convex analysis to fluid dynamics problems. Um, I had the privilege of working together with Chris uh, last year uh, in the second half of the year. Um, I helped him in teaching a linear programming course and I he learned so much about linear programming thanks to his lecture notes and um, and also the uh, the paper that he will talk about today is a paper that inspired a common research together with Chris and Yalchin that I will present next week. So I leave you with Chris who will talk to you about a direct search method for constraint optimization via the rounded L1 penalty function. Okay, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction of Regina, Regina. Um, so uh, as Regina's just read out the title here, I will move, off, move on to the, to the next page. Now, what I'm looking at here is the standard sort of um, constrained optimization problem, minimize some objective function f of x, subject to a finite number of constraints, c of x is less than or equal to zero. Um, Equality constraints can be included in this as a pair of inequalities, if nothing else. I won't put them in. It just adds to the clutter without any um, further gain in uh, information. So the basic assumptions that I'm going to make are that if and all of the um, constraints are locally Lipschitz functions. And I'm going to assume that they're back box. So you can provide a value, you get a number back for each of them. That's it. There's no gradients or anything like that that you can get back, even if they're smooth. Um, you can't access the gradients for one reason or another. Okay. Um, I'll use the symbol capital O of omega for the feasible region, which is just the set of points X that satisfy all of the constraints. Chris, are you assuming you know the Lipschitz <laughs> constants? No. That's purely for theoretical reasons, and if, if they're not, algorithm will still run, but the convergence results I develop won't have any validity. Okay, so this method I'm about to describe is um, a class of, one of the large class of direct search methods that have um, been generated over the last couple of decades by um, people like John Dennis and Charles O'Day amongst many others. Um, so Many of these methods um, make extensive use of what's called a positive basis, which was invented by, or at least documented by Chandler Davis in 1954. A positive basis for Rn is a set of vectors, V1 up to Vp, and note that the P is not the same as the N, um, such that um, any vector in Rn can be written as a linear combination of the is in the positive basis with non-negative coefficients. So the I, coefficients AI there have got to be bigger than or equal to zero. Oops. Sorry. Oh. Um, secondly, the other property of positive basis is that it's minimal in the sense that um, you can't um, throw any member out and still have a positive basis. Okay. 
and it's shown in um, Davis in 1954 that a positive basis for RN has between n plus 1 and 2n members. Um, if it's got n plus 1, it's called a minimal positive basis, and up to 2n, it's called maximal. So here's a couple of very simple examples of positive bases in two dimensions, and essentially, this is it for two dimensions. On the left, we have a minimal positive basis of three directions. And on the right, we have a maximal positive basis of four directions. And like all maximal positive bases, you see pairs of opposed vectors. Um, slightly more interestingly, here's some positive bases in three dimensions. These ones are neither minimal nor maximal. Um, the one on the left is um, actually composed of um, two sub bases. So for the horizontal plane, the three red arrows form a um, minimal positive basis. And for the vertical direction, the two blue arrow, blue arrows are a, well, maximal and minimal positive basis. But this, so there's two sub positive bases in there, effectively making up a positive basis that's neither minimal or maximal for three dimensions. Here's an example of a positive basis that isn't composable into sub bases. Okay, so here the four horizontal-ish directions, um, you start off by laying them along the coordinate axes up and down and then them all vertically downwards and the fifth direction is vertically up. Okay, now what I'm going to do for a few slides is talk about um, unconstrained minimization to start with um, and how these positive bases can be used um, in direct search methods that don't generate gradients um, to um, find, lo find local minimizers of unconstrained functions. This will form a lot of the basis of um, the attack on the constrained problem. So here, phi of x is going to be an unconstrained um, function that we seek a minimizer of, and again, it's going to be black box. Now, we start off with a, a very simple um, little result here. And that if you have some vector g, and g transpose v is bigger than or equal to zero for all vectors in a positive basis v plus, then it's got to be the zero vector. Okay, and the proof of this is extremely straightforward. What we do is we, we write minus g as a linear combination of the because vi and the positive basis with non-negative coefficients. Um, and then look at the product g transpose with minus g. And Replacing minus g with the sum up here, we get g transpose times the sum. And going over to here, we have g transpose vi, which by this is bigger than or equal to zero for all i. Ai is bigger than or equal to zero for all i. So that's a non negative quantity, which means negative length of g squared has got to be zero, and that's the zero vector. Okay, so what this shows is that if you've got a smooth function at some point x, Either the gradient is zero, just using the gradient here as effectively the g here, gradient is zero, or at least one of the vectors in the positive basis is a descent direction for psi. Okay, so this is a, a guaranteed way of generating a descent direction for a, uh, for a, a smooth function without having the gradient. Now, in practice, um, condition g transpose v is big than or equal to zero. Um, if we're using little g in a sense, we would like to make it the gradient, we don't have that opportunity. Um, we can't do that because we don't have the access to the gradient. So what we do is we replace that with finite differences like um, this. So psi of x plus hv minus psi of x is um, or equal to zero for all v in your positive basis and for some positive scale factor h. Okay, so that brings us to the um, idea of a frame. Um, and a frame is essentially a set of points that surrounds the center point of the frame. So here, x is the center point, that's the point inside the frame. H is the size or the length of the step um, along the v's, and v is your positive basis. So your frame is all of the points x plus hv, um, where v ranges across the positive basis. Okay, so 
the point X itself is not in the frame. So just go up a bit. For instance, in either of these pictures, the three arrowheads would form a frame around the origin, or in this case, the four arrowheads. Okay. Now, for all points in the frame, we have a point X bar in the frame. Psi of X bar is bigger than or equal to Psi of X minus Epsilon, which is a sort of near equivalent to this condition here. This finite difference approximation to V transpose G is bigger than zero. If that holds for all points in the frame, we call the frame quasi-minimal. Uh, with epsilon equals zero, it's minimal. The reason we do that is rather than requiring epsilon to equal to zero, is that we can use epsilon as a uh, measure of sufficient descent, which gives uh, strong advantages when constructing convergence proofs, and it allows more flexibility in the um, form of the algorithm. If you use epsilon equals zero, typically you're looking at mesh adaptive direct search type algorithms, and um, they restrain all of the points you look at to a succession of increasingly fine nested grids. Okay, so here we have the double loop structure of a um, an unconstrained algorithm for using positive bases to minimize an unconstrained function of psi. Um, the first step is basically initialization, set to two counters, j and k equal to one, pick um, a, a length scale h for your frame and some measure of sufficient percent epsilon and start somewhere. Step two is the engine room and it contains the wonderful weasel words, execute any finite process, which are absolutely invaluable in this sort of stuff. Um, Finite processes go achieve one of two things, either locate a point of sufficient descent, so psi of x plus one, the new iterate, is less than psi of x k minus epsilon, or it generates a quasi-minimal frame um, at a point that is equal to or lower than um, x k in height. Now, the obvious question is how do you do that? Well, the answer is what you try and do is b. So you pick your frame center, typically x k, you try and form a frame around it, and one of two things will happen. Either the frame will be quasi-minimal, because all of the points in the frame will be at most epsilon below um, xk in height, or one of them will be more than epsilon below xk in height, in which case you've achieved A instead of B. Okay? So that's essentially um, the main part of the algorithm as far as moving you to lower points goes. And what we do is we just repeatedly do that, um, generating a new xk each time, which is steps two and three, um, until we can no longer get sufficient percent, in which case we get case B. In that case, what we do is we typically choose a smaller h and a smaller epsilon and go back and do it again. As far as progress towards the solution goes, um, achieving A is critical. As far as Proving convergence goes, it's actually the quasi-minimal frames in step B that are critical. Step A is just what gets you from one quasi-minimal frame to the next. Okay. Um, and as you can see down the bottom here, for convergence, the critical values are Zj, Hj, Epsilon J, and Vj. And these are all the values that occur when you achieve case B. So they're the um, components of the frame here, plus your measure of sufficient percent. And when you're going through step A and just through the inner loop there, J is constant. And so all of epsilon J is constant. Um, it's only once you generate a quasi-minimal frame and you get to step four, that you can change these things. Okay, so to just show you basically how the convergence result is generated, roughly. Um, what we do is we generate an infinite sequence of quasi minimal frames with, a, with the frame centers converging to some point. Okay, so we're just selecting Z star as the point they converge to. Um, the sequence of quasi minimal frames has got to be infinite unless you do step A forever, and each time you do step A, you reduce psi by at least epsilon, which means psi goes to minus infinity. So as long as your function that you're minimizing is bounded below, you must be able to generate an infinite sequence of quasi-minimal frames. What we do next is we define 
what the limits of the positive basis bases are um, as follows. And what we do is quite simple. We impose an order on the positive bases um, and we take any subsequence that's got the same cardinality. Remember, they don't all have to be the same size, but they're between at least n plus one and at most two n members. And then we just say that each of the um, members of each positive basis has got to converge to a um, limiting direction vi infinity. And we will require that collectively those vi infinities, those limits, will themselves form a positive basis. Okay. So just looking for the moment at a subsequence of necessary so that this limit happens over this whole subsequence. Um, we have the following basic line of attack for establishing convergence. Quasi minimality of the um, frames gives us psi of zj plus hj vij uh, minus psi of zj is at least minus epsilon. Okay, so um, it's insufficient percent basically for all steps along the frame directions. Now, if we divide this thing by h and let j go to infinity, as long as hj goes to zero, you get closer and closer approximations to a um, derivative in a sense. Um, further, we require that epsilon go to zero faster than h so that this thing just disappears. Okay? And if we do that, what we get is psi of zj plus hj vi minus psi of zj over hj is bigger than or equal to zero in the limit, which implies that the Clark or generalized derivative z star along that direction is uh, non-negative. There's a slight wrinkle to going from line to that line in that um, these vectors can change around. But as long as they converge to that one, you can show that this follows here. Um, provided, and we require it, and since we choose the positive bases, we can force it, Provided that limiting set the infinity plus is a positive basis, and psi is strictly differentiable at z star, which means this Clark derivative is just the gradient transpose vi infinity. Um, the theorem that we did just a little bit earlier shows that the um, gradient there has got to be zero. Okay, so that's the sort of engine room of a um, unconstrained minimization proof in the smooth case. Okay. So what we are going to do is we're going to now go back to the um, uh, constrained case and add, bring up the penalty function and develop the theory um, for some way like that. Again, the thinking is largely initially that we are looking at things that are smooth. And so we're going to try and design our method so that it works well on anything that's smooth. It has strong convergence properties on anything that's smooth. Um, and um, so that way, if our problem actually turns out to be smooth, it will work well and quickly. However, behind it, we're going to use all of the stuff um, that uh, accesses the Clark derivative here to develop further convergence proofs, uh, weaker ones, but nevertheless convergence results in the case when things are not smooth, okay? And we will design our algorithm with sort of backups into it so that it um, can uh, cope with such situations, at least to some extent. So here's our penalty function phi, which is essentially unconstrained because all of the constraints, the CIs, have been added to F in the form of penalty terms here, xi, the CI, theta i, mu i, w. Okay, now there's quite a collection of parameters there. Um, I'll show you a picture in a second, the next slide. These guys here, we all control, and they are designed to operate these penalty terms in a way that gets feasibility and um, satisfies active constraints exactly, rather than having a sort of significant error. So the penalty term, here's the um, sort of mathematical definition. Um, Ci is the constraint function, theta is an offset, mu is the standard penalty parameter va uh, value, for instance, like the L1 penalty parameter, and W is a rounding width. So here, if C is less than the offset theta, so the constraint is um, not active, 
at zero. Between theta and theta plus w, which is the rounding width, it's this quadratic function of c here. And above, c is above um, the offset theta plus the rounding width, w, it reverts to a linear function here. Okay. Um, and in the specific case when w and theta are zero, Sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt you, Chris. The yep. CI is, is CI of X? Yes. Yes, okay. CI, CI, CI of X, but I've just left the X CI out of for X. Okay. control. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Um, so what happens is if, if, if you put W equal to zero um, and theta equal to zero, what happens is you just go back to the standard one norm exact penalty function term. Here, square bracket C plus is the maximum of C and zero. Here's a picture. It speaks far better than the maths. So here's your um, offset. Here's horizontal axis is the C value, C of X. As C of X increases once it hits the offset, the quadratic term kicks in and it rises quadratically like that in a continuously differentiable fashion. Once you get across the rounding width from the offset to theta plus w, the quadratic is replaced by a linear slope like that, similar to the L1 exact penalty terms. Okay. Now, this interval where it's quadratic is centered, or well, not centered, but straddles the point c equals zero. The left of the vertical axis here, c is less than zero and that's feasible. To the right, it's given zero and it's infeasible. And we always choose theta so that theta and theta plus w lie on either side um, of that c equals zero boundary, which represents the edge of the feasible region. The other thing you can see from this picture is that um, penalty term zeta, xi, sorry, capital xi, is always non negative, which means your um, penalty function psi is always lower bounded by. If your objective function f of x everywhere in Rn. Okay. The reason for that is that um, as long as f of x is bounded below, um, you can't go roaring off to minus infinity, and that's as we've seen before, that's important for ensuring that we get a, an infinite sequence of quasi-minimal frames, which we need to prove convergence. Okay, here um, we have a rather messy slide. I'm sorry about that, but this is the bones of a constrained equivalent of that unconstrained algorithm. So steps, I'll just briefly go through them and then go slightly in more detail. The first step is just initialization. Second step, um, it's your um, frame you're going to use. The third step is the um, engine room of the process, which tries to find sufficient percent or because it looks at all of the points in your positive basis generating the frame or all of the steps, um, if it doesn't get sufficient percent, it returns a quasi minimal frame. Okay, then steps four, five, six, and seven, um, or rather five, six, and seven, uh, once a quasi minimal frame is obtained, they adjust things and um, restart the process by going back up to step two. Okay, step four here is says a sufficient percent is obtained. In a new point that's not has sufficient percent and go back to step two. So that those three steps just keep cycling around up until you get a quasi minimal frame. Then we do step five. Step five is essentially a recording step. All it does is choose a new iterate lower than the or not higher than the previous um, frame center. It records the frame center zj as xk as zj, the positive basis you use wk as vj, and any other points which are in the set sk you look at as well as the positive basis up here as sj qmf for quasi minimal frame. Okay, that's just recording so that I can talk about them for um, convergence purposes later. Then check stopping additions, update the various parameters parameters, the frame size, the measure of sufficient descent, and the bounding width, and then the offsets um, go back to step two. The important thing here 
is that all of those parameters are indexed by j, and j stays constant while you go through this inner loop, set 234, uh, which finds points of sufficient descent and continually reduces psi j by at least epsilon. Okay, so it's got the same basic structure as the um, previous one. It's just rather messier looking. Um, and the probably the extra bit of real significance is this SK. So we're not only looking at the point, the vectors in the positive places, we have further directions chucked in there as well. And this is the place, which is the equivalent of that finite pro, arbitrary finite process earlier, where we can hide things like quasi-Newton steps and global direction searches and all sorts of things like that. So that's where a lot of the action goes to get the algorithm to go quickly. That's the um, frame center ZJ, the basis VJ, etc., which um, we use to get the convergence results. So, like a lot of um, direct search algorithms, things are separated quite um, significantly in a sense of the convergence proof and what makes it go fast in practice. Okay, so as I said, the method consists of two loops. The inner loop is just steps two to four, and all of those parameters defining sufficient percent frame size itself and the um, psi j function are constant. What happens with this um, in the loop is if it goes forever, psi j goes to infinity uh, as k goes to infinity because you reduce it by epsilon every time. So either f is unbounded below or you strike a quasi minimal frame. Okay, so and since we repeatedly execute that in the loop, that means we get an infinite sequence of quasi minimal frames. And the outer loop um, just adjusts the parameters, the frame size, sufficient percent, and the um, parameters for the penalty terms every time, which effectively this finds a new psi j. Okay, this is step three in practice. It looks horrendous, so I'll just sort of um, walk through it. Um, point out the main ideas. Essentially, all you have to do is calculate psi to j at all of the points on the frame. If you do that, you will get a method that does not go very quickly. So what we do is we do that first. Once we've got the points in that frame, we can use it to construct a finite difference estimate of the gradient of psi, even if it's not differentiable. So you can, the estimate won't approximate the gradient if it doesn't exist, but you can create that estimate. You can use that to um, those estimates form quasi-Newton directions. So we have a matrix BK that we update from time to time using the BFGS update. And we can use that to generate a quasi-Newton search direction PQ, PQN. And we can do an Armijo ray search, either backtracking or forward tracking, depending on whether PQN is a descent step um, without um, restriction. If we get sufficient descent, it's fine, step three stops there. If that doesn't work, the next thing it tries is to do a, a Miho range search through the along the um, best frame direction. Remember, we've found all of the points in the frame up here um, to see if it, that gives sufficient potential. Again, if it doesn't work, it has one more trick up its sleeve, which is to then look elsewhere around your current iterator at xk to try and find a descent direction and do an Armijo line search on that. And that looking elsewhere is by looking at um, points on the unit hypersphere or vectors of length one, um, such, and then looking at the point, points xk plus h times u. So that scales the unit hypersphere by h and then looks at points around um, <coughs> xk to try and find a descent direction. Okay. All of those points collectively form that set SK. And since SK is arbitrary, apart from it has to be a finite set, you can do things like that and many, many other things with impunity, as long as it's a finite process and it stops. Okay. So what I'm going to talk about here briefly is the um, global direction search. And Again, all we're doing is looking at other vectors u that are essentially play the same role as the VJs from the positive basis. Um, 
that are of length one. And we're looking at phi of j at various points there. And for simplicity, I'm just going to use capital F of u to denote, you know, phi j of xk plus hj u. So it's just a point evaluated on the unit hypersphere, radius hj centered on xk. And all we're trying to do with this global direction search is to find a point um, lower than psi of j of xk, or lower than xk, at least it, more than epsilon. Okay, so a sufficient percent. Um, and any global direction search algorithm will do here. Um, I used a relatively simple one, uh, which is a variant of accelerated random search by Apple, Labar, and Rajulovich. Um, what it does is it just generates random points on SN, but the distributions they're drawn from cluster more and more around the best point that you know of, which I'm going to call UB. There's a finite number of these distributions, which get successively smaller and closer to UB. Once you've gone through the whole lot, if you haven't found a better point, you just go back and start again through the distributions again and again, until you either find a point of sufficient percent, or you use up all your allocated function evaluations. Okay, and this is essentially a restatement of what I've just said before in more detail. Um, we choose some UB and SN um, on the hypersphere, and then we, as our current S, as a random point, and we generate points, further points, U on the hypersphere, and we shift them towards UB along the great circle in SN that contains U and UB. Okay? And the shift gets steadily more and more um, pronounced towards UB as um, we, the probability of distributions shrink closer and closer to UB. Um, and essentially what happens is we have this parameter rho starts off at one and the fraction of the shift along the arc of the great circle from U to UB is one minus rho. So initially it's no shift. And then each iteration we reduce rho by a factor of root two until it gets so small that we reset it to one. Okay. Um, and essentially just execute that process until we either run out of function evaluations that we're prepared to spend on it, or we get a sufficient descent direction. And, neither can, and, and if we get any descent, we then do a line search. Okay. The last thing <clears throat> before we look at convergence for a few slides is how we choose those theta j's. The h, w's, and the mu's are much more simple. These things are somewhat more tricky. And the answer is that we exploit the fact that um, each basic minimal frame center zj um, is, a, a, in a sense, an approximate minimizer of psi j, or at least a stationary point, because um, if psi j was differentiable at zj, um, it would provide weak evidence that that gradient was zero. Okay, so using that and comparing it with the balance equation, we write out grad of psi j. Um, we get this thing here, grad f add plot times grad c, and so this stuff here provides estimates of the Lagrange multipliers, which is just this thing here. All we do is we say, okay, once we found these our estimates of the Lagrange multipliers. What we actually want is estimates of the Lagrange multipliers when ci are zero. Okay, so we say, if we set those to zero and adjust the mu, the w, and the theta, um, what value of theta would we get? And that's given by this formula down here. So what we do is once we found this value here, we say set c to zero, and we're going to update mu and w to give these new values here. And we get a, a new expression here that's still going to equal xij. We can solve that for theta, new theta, which gives us this formula here. And then we do one final change. We require that theta j plus one is between minus wj and zero. And this is by, um, if it's less than that, we increase it um, to minus wj plus one. The reason we do that, if I just go back a little bit, is that we want that um, theta, theta plus w, to bracket 
the point where c equals zero. So if we go back to that picture there, we want that, that, and that value to be either side of um, c equals zero. So we need theta to be less than or equal to zero, not more negative than minus w. And the reason we want to do this is that the algorithm is going to shift theta back and forth to control the slope just at that point there to try and exactly balance the slope of f so that um, the minimizer of our function psi j fits exactly on c equals zero for an active constraint. So there's no offset caused by the penalty terms. Okay. So that brings us to the requirements for convergence. Uh, the first two are straightforward and they're really about the problem rather than the algorithm. The sequence of iterates is bounded. Um, so you don't roll off to minus infinity trying to minimize e to the x or something. The second one is that the sequence of function values um, is bounded below. Okay, and that means that you can't obtain sufficient descent forever, which means we have an infinite sequence of quasi-mineral frames. Third one says that hj has got to go to zero, and wj has also got to go to zero as j goes to infinity. So that means the frames shrink in size to zero, and Rounding the width of the rounding region of the um, penalty terms also gets smaller and smaller, ultimately converging to zero, hence converging to the L1 exact penalty terms. The next one was well, the one we've had before from the unconstrained case. The sufficient descent measure has got to go to zero faster than the frame size. This one's the new one, and it's the one that's needed that, that necessitates the use of the offsets theta. What it says is that the frame sizes have got to go to zero faster than the width of the rounding region. Okay, so um, what that means is that ultimately the frames, the, the, the non-linearity or the, the, the approaching non-smoothness as wj goes to zero is invisible on the scale of a frame because the frame is going to zero in size much faster. If you don't have that, um, convergence unravels. Okay. The downside about having that is that you can't shove um, wj very far towards zero. If you start off with hj, in the case of this algorithm, is 10 to the minus 6, and bring it down to 10 to the minus 10, that's a range of 10 to the 4. W has got to be significantly less than that, so it might go down by a factor of, say, 100. Okay. So that doesn't give you a lot of scope for um, converging to the L1 exact penalty function on its own, but if you use it in conjunction with the offsets to balance out the slopes, um, you can get very good um, points that are very, very close to being exactly on active constraints. Okay, the last two, if we've had four, um, the sequence of um, the bases, whichever sequence that you end up having to look at, they always converge to a positive basis. Okay, we've had that before. That's easy. We control VK, we choose them um, completely. The last one is thing G, and it says the set of points, including the positive basis, as well as all of the other points in the Newton direction, the line search, and the global direction search, contain at least one U. Um, chosen randomly from the unit hypersphere. Okay. If is needed in the smooth case to show convergence, G is for the non-smooth case. G is absolutely minimalist, in the sense that it establishes convergence in theory. In practice, you need to do far, far stronger things than that to get anything useful, which is why we have employed the global direction search. Even randomly picking um, the orientation of your positive basis achieve this isn't really enough you need to do more than that okay so the convergence proof basically goes along the following lines um, again we look only at the, the iterates where quasi minimal frames are generated and we look at um, vectors vj and um, either sj which is the um, quasi newton direction and things like that or in vj um, and if we look at Crazy minimality since we didn't get sufficient descent. We have phi j of zj plus hj vj minus phi j of zj, so that's the drop um, at most epsilon, 
minus epsilon, sorry, the measure of sufficient fatigue. Okay. Using this, provided the penalty parameters of mu j remain bounded, you can show after some um, algebra that this line marked by five is true. Here, all for the fj, since psi is f plus the sum of the penalty terms, the f is just this f part of this divided by h. A significant amount of working around with the xi penalty terms gives you this thing here. We have the z to ij are the things just down here. They're the Lagrange multiplier estimates we had before. And we have the Clark derivatives of um, the constraint at z star in the direction v star, where the directions in vj converge to v star. And lastly, we have a set of terms that disappears, and that includes the um, measure of sufficient descent. A lot of other things too arise when you go from the xi's to this thing here. Okay, so for the non smooth case, what we establish is a fairly weak result um, that the um, Clark derivative of objective function along all direct all feasible directions v and the set of feasible directions at z star, or here I've written x star, um, is um, the equal to zero. Okay, um, the, this is just the standard definition of a set of feasible directions um, from Fitch's book or many other places. Okay, um, so it doesn't preclude the existence of feasible descent directions. And the classic example is if f is minus the absolute value of x in one dimension, um, the Clark derivative is positive in all directions, both of them. It's actually at x equals zero, it's positive in both directions, but it's actually a maximizer. Okay, so it's not a very strong result. Um, and um, so there's infeasible points as well as feasible points because the algorithm generates lots of infeasible points. And what can happen is that the slope of f can be positive in the infeasible region, but there will be a descent direction in the uh, feasible region. So the positive slope in the infeasible region will give you a non-negative Clark derivative. Okay, so essentially the proof um, assumes that you're converging to z star and the vj's are converging to some vector, some feasible direction v star. Um, and the random points that you generate um, in each and, and um, item G above, um, ensure that um, for any V star that you pick in there, there is a subsequence of VJs that converge to it almost surely. Okay. Now what we do is we also assume that the active constraints are regular at Z star, so that the Clark derivative of the constraints, the active constraints, is equal to the directional derivative. And um, that guarantees these directional derivatives are less than or equal to zero for the feasible directions. Okay, and then if we go back up a couple of slides. What you've got from this is that the zeta ij is in the equal to zero, the Clark derivatives are less than or equal to zero, so this term is negative. As j goes to infinity, this term is zero, so you've got the um, finite difference here in the limit being bigger than or equal to zero, which gives you the um, non negative Clark derivative. Okay, the last slide for um, just to outline the convergence results. If you do have strict differentiability of all the functions, all the active constraints and the objective function at the point you're converging to, you can get a different convergence proof, which is much stronger. It shows KKT conditions um, under the assumption that the penalty parameters mu j remain finite, which is um, an implicit first order constraint qualification. Um, Along the following lines. Okay, so strict differentiability means the Clark derivatives are just V transpose times the gradient at um, the relevant point and for the relevant function. Okay, now requirement F means the sequence of positive bases converges to a positive limiting positive basis V plus infinity. Um, so here we've got our first KK can be condition. We've assumed that Z star is feasible. Um, the zeta i are always bigger than or equal to zero, so the Lagrange multipliers are of the right sign. Um, you can show 
using that formula there that if ci is negative for an inactive constraint um, as w goes to zero eventually this in here is zero and so the Lagrange multiplier estimates come out to zero which gives you complementarity and lastly for the balance equation from the kkt conditions or well, the um, that z star is a stationary point of Lagrangian if you go back up here in the limit um, that's v transpose grad f v transpose grad c it's in the limit that's v transpose grad f it appears uh, these are Lagrange multiplier estimates um, Lagrange multiplier estimates are bounded as long as the mu's are bounded so they've got to converge to something and so you get the, um, ultimately that v transpose grad l is bigger than or equal to zero for all v in a positive basis which means it's a stationary point okay um, that's more than enough of that let's ask the real question how well does it work in practice um, I tested the method um, using the following setup all of the positive bases were just um, maximal positive bases that just step up and down each coordinate direction one after the other um, so um, are all the same so convergence with the positive basis and all that sort of things is automatic initially we start off with mu equals one no offset to the minus three is our measure of sufficient descent, the rounding region at point one and frame size at 10 to the minus six. Oops, don't do that. Um, we reduce h by a factor sigma, which is two thirds. Epsilon we reduce by uh, the square of that and w by the square root of that, which achieves um, aims one, two, three, and four, or a, b, c, and d, I think. Up above. And the algorithm just stops when the frame size h gets down to 10 to the minus 10. The mu's, the penalty parameters, if the constraint values aren't going to zero fast enough, um, so they aren't at least halving, unless they're below 10 to the minus 5, we simply bump them up by a factor of 4. And using that setup there, you can figure out how many iterations it's going to take the algorithm if. Um, you start at the minimizer, so um, no iteration, no function evaluations used up moving at all. It's just generating one quasi minimal frame after another, ever, ever smaller until it hits the 10 to the minus 10 and stops. And it's roughly 174n, where n is the dimension of the problem, plus 1360. Most of them are actually in the backtracking our MIHO ray searches for the um, quasi Newton thing. That gives you sort of an idea of. For instance, in four dimensions, that's about 2,000. So it gives you an idea of um, what you can expect as a minimum. Okay. So this was tested on three sets of functions. The first were from Hock and Shipkowski, um, and I picked a bunch of problems which all had equality constraints. Those problems are smooth, um, so I turned them into non-smooth problems by taking the equality constraints, absolute valuing them, and making them have to be less than or equal to zero. Okay. Um, second one uh, set is from uh, Lukshan and Lukchek, and um, it's a variety from those two ones. The LV problems are all inherently non-smooth and constrained. Um, the ones are unconstrained, in which case I added a but, but non-smooth, and I've added constraints into them. Without either without um, shifting the unconstrained solution or where there is a, an identifiable new solution. Two of them have um, a set of smooth constraints like this, three of them. The rest of them have function constraints like max x minus min x is less or equal to zero, which is only ever satisfied when all of the x components are the same, or constraints like this with absolute values in or something like that. So nothing particularly horrendous apart from that one there. Um, non smooth, nevertheless, as along with the non smooth objectives. Okay, so in these two tables here, um, this one on the next slide, we have 30 run averages for the various sets of problems. Um, N is the dimension, ms is the number of smooth constraints, mn is the number of non smooth constraints, optimal function value. Number of function values taken to find the minimum on average, 
by halting with h less than 10 to the minus 10. Relative error, f, which is the difference between f, the value f found in f star, divided by either one or the magnitude of f star, whichever, whichever was bigger. So if f star is small, uh, for instance, error here, it's an absolute error. If it's large, like the 5,000 here, it's a relative error. And EC here is just the largest constraint violation. So what you can see, if you look down these two things here, it's reasonably well. Um, for HS77, that's not particularly brilliantly good. But um, on the plus side, if you look at the constraint violations, they're actually really small. They're all positive. Okay, so it's ever so slightly in the infeasible region, which means it's more done a very good job of landing right on the active constraints, which is exactly what the purpose of the the thetas were in conjunction with the reducing rounding region given by the W. These last three things here, QN frame and GDS, give the percentage of um, iterations where either the quasi Newton, the frame, or the global direction search steps um, have sufficient percent. And um, so, for instance, here, remembering that the quasi Newton one is first go, and if it succeeds, the other two get, don't get done. Failing that the frame has second go, and if it succeeds, the global direction search doesn't get done, other than that the global direction search gets a crank. So for instance, this last one here, 81% of the steps were quasi-Newton ones, and they were successful. Another 13 along the frame directions, uh, another is up and down the coordinate axes, and then 1% of them were the global direction search. Okay, so, um, and if you look at some of these easier problems, these numbers are about 50% in total, a bit over 50%. So half the time it was generating a quasi Newton group, uh, it was generating a sufficient descent step, the other half the time it threw up a um, minimal, quasi minimal frame. Here's the um, problems with non smooth objective functions if the LVs are from uh, Luxham um, and the rest are from Kamitsa. Uh, dimensions range from 6 to 50. The um, LV ones all have smooth constraints. Other ones, um, apart from max q, which um, has a, they all have non-smooth objective functions. The other ones have either one non-smooth constraint, or in this case for L and Mifflin two forty-eight smooth constraints being the Brodin family of constraints. Again, if you look down these numbers here, there's a wide variety of um, average number of function evaluations taken. Of them are quite slow. Mifflin and Goffin, for instance, pushed it quite hard. Looking down the relative errors, there are some ones that are fairly iffy. So uh, some of them were quite good, for instance, chain Mifflin down to 10 to the minus 10. Wong 2 was the single hardest one. It's a non smooth version. It solves the smooth version of Wong 2 problem very easily. Um, 3 minus 3 um, is not particularly good, um, but because it's non smooth, it corresponds to an error in the x values of about the same magnitude. Uh, again, constraint violations are just bigger than zero, showing that it's good at getting at least very close to being on the edge of the feasible region. Um, again, what we see here, as in the last um, table, is that the um, quasi-Newton step does the vast bulk of the work in terms of making progress. The frame one does a fair bit of it too. The frame one is often free because it just immediately fails. And the global direction search is the sort of last cab off the rank that does um, makes progress when nothing else is working. Nevertheless, if you chuck the global direction search out, um, it fails on 10 of the 26 problems listed in the two. Um, tables. So they make it, it makes a difference even though it isn't used very often, it's much better to use the cheaper crazy Newton search directions when you can to make progress. Um, one last set of results, um, I'll just show you one more set of problem, one more problem class. This is a cones problem which has an objective to start with before we twist it out of shape maximum of all of the variables y1 to yn at the sum of the magnitudes where square brackets plus of y is the larger of yi or zero. We have a single uh, hyperspherical constraint on which the origin 
lies on the boundary of this constraint. Um, when rho is between a random vector with elements between one and two, you can show that um, the solution, just this minimizing f subject to this constraint is y equals zero. What we do to sort of make it messier is first add some cone shaped constraints, which are constraints like this, and these cones are just, um, they exclude an infeasible, they define an infeasible region, uh, which is cone shaped with the apex at the origin and a semi angle of pi on three in a random direction where ui is a random vector. Um, so the point of non smoothness at the solution of this thing up here. Since they are um, star shaped with respect to the origin, what and objective function up here is convex, what it means is. Um, y equals zero is still the one and only minimizer, which is what we really want to keep um, because um, it means if we find it, we know, if we don't find it, we know we failed. We haven't found some other minimizer we don't know about. And lastly, we off, so these are the real variables, x, actual variables. So we offset um, the x variables by a random number omega, for i equals one to n, and then we apply this um, transformation here, which is essentially cubic for each variable, um, to twist the whole thing out of shape so that it's no longer convex or star-shaped or anything like that. It's still unimodal, so it only has one solution. Okay, so um, here you see y n is defined by t n, and hence x n, y n minus one by t n and t n minus one and all of the rest of them yi by ti and ti plus one and ti plus two which is essentially is xi xi plus one and xi plus two from that okay so this transformation is invertible um and it's full of random numbers the alphas um the betas and the gammas here are all random numbers between naught and one okay um so once we've done that we have a finite a final cones like problem minimize f of y of x f is defined above, subject to the constraint c of y of x, where the ci is defined above, and the x is connecting to the y's through this stuff up here. So using uh, random initial points from the uh, box minus one to one in all variables, for um, dimensions three to 48, and the same number of total constraints, so the number of cone constraints is from two to 47, you get these curves here, these are data profiles here. Here's the number of simplex gradients, which is a measure of the computational work. So that's n times n plus one function evaluations, little n plus one function evaluations. And here's the number of problems solved out of 100 within n simplex gradients. And as you can see, um, it solves them all. And there's just a steady march of these curves to the right as the number of dimensions and cones goes up. The Cones and high dimensions are, are needle-like because they're just the curse of dimensionality and are less significant. Out of three and six dimensions, they're quite substantial parts of Rn, and so they have quite an effect. But this provides further evidence that the method works reasonably well in practice. Um, the initial points are chosen from minus one to one to the n which is relatively close to the solution generally. Um, if you choose them more widely, further away from the solution, what you find is that sometimes you get failures some, um, for equals 50 out to say 200. Uh, you might get a 10% failure rate even with 5,000 simplex function evaluations. Okay, and there's the, um, the references. Okay. I'll, uh, stop there. Thank you very much for listening to all of that. Um, I hope it was of some use to you. Um, were there any questions? So, okay. So, uh, are there any questions from, from the audience? Um, I, I have one, uh, yep. uh, Chris. Uh, it's Andrew here. Um, I, I'm, I'm just, um, um, yes, yes. <laughs> I'm just, just, just wondering, I mean, my, my kind of, um, when I'd looked at some of these methods before, when people had, uh, 
uh, used essentially kind of a indicator function as a way in which you impose constraints, then you had to yep. orient the uh, the frames in order to get feasible descent directions. Yep. It was a frame orientation problem. Yep. Uh, and and uh, you seem to uh, overcome that by using the uh, um, the quasi Newton method on the penalty, where you put put the information into the penalty function. Yep. And it seems seems in, my intuition is that is that it's finding these feasible descent directions by kind of exploiting the structure of the penalty function. So you get all these quasi Newton updates that seem to be important to get it to converge. Yep. But, um, but why do, why, do you, why do you think the global descent direction is kind of a needed uh, to get it unstuck, you know, because somehow clearly it kind of fails yep. intermittently, doesn't it, to, along those lines, isn't it? It, it does. Um, my guess is that every so often it gets itself so close to a discontinuity in one of the constraints or the objective function that there's only sort of a narrow cone of descent directions, relatively speaking and the quasi-Newton direction isn't amongst them. So since everything else apart from the global direction search is deterministic, once it fails, it's, it can't move itself unless it does something like that global direction search. So it, it really is a large ditch attempt, but at least in the test problems I was using, it was valuable on several of them. Yeah, I, I see. So it's kind of to do with how, how thin the kind of cone... Yeah, of if it's too thin... Even the global search won't find it in a reasonable number of function evaluations, and you're sort of stuck. <laughs> okay, so thanks for that. That, that's, uh, that was enlightening. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, I have. Um, yes, Matt. One, please. One um, so it seems like uh, if, if we just consider the unconstrained case, so for the, the very first part of the talk, um, yep. that a lot of the algorithm is really dependent on descent properties as you go along. Um, my question is, is there any hope in trying to apply some analogous method to a minimax problem? So something like uh, minimize over x, the maximum, minimize over x, maximize over y, a function f of x, y, just in the unconstrained case in the first instance. Um, ah, so, so y, y can range over an infinite set. Yeah, so I'm thinking that uh, both are, say, you know, Rn and Rm, say. Yep. I have no answer to that one. I've never looked at it. Um, if it was a finite set, it would be relatively straightforward because you can turn it into a constrained optimization problem. But... Yeah. Um, it's quite possible that it would, but I can't say anything definite. Okay. I wonder if the, all the descent properties would have to be, yeah, it seems like if you're not just looking for a minimum, they have to be modified in some appropriate way, I guess. Yes, because you, you're trying to maximize with respect to Y and minimize with respect to, yeah. Um, hmm. If you could sort of treat it as a semi-infinite programming problem, you might be able to get something useful out of it because essentially you consider the, all of the local near-global minimizers with respect to Y yeah. and use them to generate at least initially a finite set of constraints and work from there. Um, but whether it would work in practice or not, uh, I don't know. It might be um, sufficiently nasty that it, in practice you don't, the, me the method doesn't find any decent descent directions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? In, in fact, uh, Matthew's question inspired me to ask you um, an, another question that maybe you were thinking of. So you, you previously worked in semi-infinite uh, optimization by choosing a finite number of constraints. So. Could you apply this uh, a similar method like this one by choosing a finite number of constraints uh, in, an, in a suitable way for the semi-infinite programming problem? Possibly, yes. I mean, the, the points you'd want, whether it be if you're um, semi-infinite constraints is that, so g of x and t is less than, z, less than or equal to zero, where the t is the um, variable for the semi-infinite constraint and the x is from the uh, objective, 
um, you'd want the ones that were maximizers with respect to T. Mm -hmm. As yes. long as there was a finite number of those, if you push those down, then at least for a little while, you push the constraint and feasibility down. But um, yeah, it might be one of those things that can work in theory, but doesn't go very well in practice. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But you have papers on semi-infinite... Uh, oh, a lo long time ago. <laughs> yeah, sort of 1980s. <laughs> uh -huh. So, yeah. Okay, so are there any last questions for Chris? Okay, if we don't have uh, more questions, let's uh, thank, thank our speaker for his beautiful talk. And uh, so... Next week, we will have a talk that uses a similar function as a Lagrangian function as the one Chris has presented today. So we look forward to having you next week. And I pass it now to Joa. Ah, okay. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you Regina. Uh, so yet uh, next week we have uh, uh, actually her talk in uh, the same topic. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you very much and have a nice weekend. Take care. Yeah. Thank you, Hala. Thank you, Irina. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank See you, you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.